Under Cover of Night is a new kind of true crime tale. In 1996, British expat Sue Knight is found dead in her small town Texas home. Soon after, a friend gets a phone call from a woman claiming to be Sue, and the executor of her estate claims to receive calls from the CIA and Scotland Yard. Sue's house is discovered to contain specialized firearms, hundreds of prescription bottles, evidence of multiple aliases, a room of advanced computer equipment, and beheaded teddy bears. So who was Sue Knight really? Listen to the Apple TV Plus original podcast under cover of night on Apple Podcasts. When it comes to health and wellness, good sleep is essential. Ashley invites you to a new era of sleep with the latest in sleep technologies. Experience all-night cooling with the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection or rest easy with adaptive pressure relief on the all-new Purple Collection thanks to its Gel Flex Grid. Don't lose sleep over choosing a new mattress. Your perfect fit is here at Ashley. Shop online or visit an Ashley store today. Better sleep starts here. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man who, much like myself, believes that the slogan for our show should be True Crime Garage. Try it with cold pizza. Here is the captain. Oh, hell yeah. It's good to be seen and good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. Today, we are still sipping on this powerful old ale called the Bible Salesman. This is an old style ale aged in bourbon barrels. It's dark and boozy. Drink it in your garage, our garage grade, three and a half bottle caps out of five. And here's some thanks and praise and cheers to those that helped us fill up the old garage fridge this week. First up, a double fisted cheers to Maddie and Christine, the TCG Wisconsin twins. Thank you to the Wisconsin sisters. And last but certainly not least, here's a big shout out and congratulations to longtime listener and new friend of the show, Rebecca, graduating from Michigan State University with a degree in criminal justice. So a big cheers and congratulations to Rebecca. And a big thank you to everyone tuning in this week and to everyone who has contributed to the beer fund. Yeah, B-W-E-W-R-U-N, beer run. Make sure you go to truecrimegarage.com and sign up on the mailing list. A new promo code is going out this week. That is enough of the business. All right, everybody, gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. Haven't seen the reports, the criminal history of a one Harvey L. Kerrigan. Detectives Dwayne Homan and William Bowman of Seattle PD are investigating this individual because he's the owner of the successful gas station where supposedly the missing girl, 15-year-old Kathy Sue Miller, was supposed to go to fill out paperwork to apply for a job at this gas station. Our situation is this. Police are armed with two things. Suspicion about a man that they know has a lengthy history, a lengthy violent history that includes rape and murder. They also have this other item of two persons, Kathy Sue Miller's mother and her boyfriend, both saying that they were aware that she was supposed to meet with that man on the night that she never came home. The problem here is, Captain, we don't have a body. We don't have a witness saying that they saw Kathy Sue Miller get into this man's car. 
All we have is this guy with this lengthy criminal history telling police, I went to the location, she wasn't there. Now, police go back, the detectives go back to Kathy Sue Miller's mother, and they tell her, look, we are every bit as concerned as you are. Here's our findings. We talked with the owner of the gas station. We interviewed him. There's nothing suggesting that we should arrest him. There is nothing suggesting that we could find any evidence to build a case against this guy. However, here's what we know about him. Here's his background. We are terribly afraid that he has done something very bad to your daughter. Mrs. Miller, of course, agrees. Now she's beyond words, right? Inconsolable. All of her suspicions have now been verified minus physical proof, minus seeing her daughter. And she tells the detectives, okay, so what are you going to do? Are you going to get a search warrant, search his home, search his property, search his business, his cars? She's hoping that they could search his home. And because we have such a short window of time that's expired, that possibly they would find her daughter maybe being held captive at his home. Reluctantly, the detectives have to tell the mom, we're sorry, there's nothing, no evidence, no proof here. We cannot get, cannot secure a search warrant at this time. We will keep watching him. We will keep interviewing him. We're going to continue to talk to other people, but we need to build a case against this guy at the very least to get those search warrants to try to find evidence or perhaps find your daughter. Well, the man that Kathy talked to last has a suspicious and deadly past. As a parent, I would think that would raise the worry level up quite a bit. A couple of days after she's missing, the mother receives a phone call from a male caller. This is very strange. This is a, a crossroads for this mother, because on one hand, you got to feel like this is horrifying, right? Could this be the person that took my daughter? The other thing is it could be somebody calling in a ransom, right? And that the daughter has been kept held against her will, but is unharmed and healthy and now they're calling in the ransom so they can collect and return the daughter. And keep in mind, this is 1973. This is still years not too far removed from when ransoms were very common when a child or a youngster would go missing and, and was abducted. And the detectives told the mother to actually hope for a ransom caller. And we do know from other cases that we've covered and stories that we've covered here that you can get a ransom call that could be a hoax. But in a weird way, Mrs. Miller is hopeful when she hears the man's voice on this phone call. Now, it turns out not what she wants it to be, but it is a breadcrumb, hopefully a breadcrumb trail leading her to her daughter. The caller says that they had found some school books He's calling from a business right? and in their parking lot area found and recovered some school books. And when looking through the school books, they discovered the name along with a phone number and they were simply calling to return the books, the lost books to the rightful owner. This is her daughter's school books. Remember she went directly from school, never came home and was last seen waiting for the owner of the gas station to pick her up. Police get these school books and they're looking through the books for a clue. This is really interesting to me too, because th this is something I've seen with primarily with plastics and things of that nature, but I've seen it on occasion with paper as well. You talk about the John Bonet case, right? And there's been other ransom notes in, in uh, the, the Larry Jean bell case. They fingerprinted some paper in that case as well. This case, what they did was they, they tested, they attempted to lift prints from the school books. Hey, and if you're going to be a part of the true crime world, you're going to have your moments where you're going to 
really lay into law enforcement, bash law enforcement. But this is one where you have to give kudos to them. Because what what do we have already in this case? We have a possible suspect. Mm -hmm. So this guy's saying, eh, I never met her, never picked her up. But if you can find fingerprints on those books that match his fingerprints, then you know he's not telling you the truth. Yeah, and even if you can't trace it back to this guy, let's say you pull prints from these books and it's from somebody that's in your system. Right. Now you have somebody else to talk to. The unfortunate situation ends up being that the only prints they pull from the books are of the persons at this place of work that they recovered them from. And because they have such strong suspicion on Harvey Kerrigan, they have no reason to suspect the persons that seem to just be a good Samaritan trying to return these lost books. Right. So it doesn't really give them any breadcrumbs and it also doesn't really lead them or build any evidence against their prime suspect who we know they will have Harvey Kerrigan's prints on file because he's been convicted and charged so many times prior to the disappearance of Kathy Sue Miller. Unfortunately, Captain, Kathy Sue Miller's body is found months later by two boys who are hiking on an Indian reservation north of Everett, Washington. Right. She was wrapped and bundled in a sheet of visqueen plastic and beaten with a heavy object believed to be possibly a hammer that left nickel-sized holes in her skull. Is this uh, plastic unique? The plastic is not unique. So Visqueen, some of our listeners will be familiar with this. This is the type of plastic that you would find at when, like when somebody's doing a home remodeling project or a construction project that you would buy these large sheets, these large rolls of Visqueen Mm -hmm. and you can roll it out and unfold it. And then you can use it kind of like Dexter to corn off a, a whole area. And so you do, in, in remodeling projects, you don't get dust and debris everywhere, especially when you're when you have to do demo and things like that. This fist queen, though, is going to be a potential breadcrumb trail. And what's so great is this will allow them, officers Homan and Bowman, to get that search warrant that they were desperately seeking in the Kathy Sue Miller case. So you have the body. The Visqueen becomes important because what they end up doing is they they get a a call. A gentleman reaches out to the detectives and says, oh, by the way, I kind of know Harvey Kerrigan. We're kind of friends. And I happen to give him a roll of Visqueen plastic prior to when this kid went missing. And they say, okay, great. Do you have any any that you used prior? Right. Do you still happen to have any that you used prior? And luckily so, I believe the way the story goes is that he used some to lay down in, in the trunk of either his wife's or daughter's car. So they're able to retrieve that. Now what they're hoping, the detectives are hoping, is that they're going to get some kind of match to one of the cut sides or torn sides of the visqueen that they found Kathy Sue wrapped up in. And what happens is they compare the two. And unfortunately it's not a match. Now that doesn't mean that it didn't come from the same role. Right. It just, it just means that it wasn't, it it wasn't directly torn or cut from the sheet that they had as a sample. And, so this is, is a bit of a Debbie Downer for their investigation as far as building evidence against Harvey Kerrigan. Yeah, a little bit of a letdown for old Homan and Bowman. But because they get this search warrant, they are granted permission to search his property and his vehicles as well as the business itself. Inside his vehicle they are able to take a bunch of prints. Now, this is interesting, too, because the other part that you have here, Captain, is you now have an additional crime scene, the location of where her body was found. And so this is the Tulip Reservation, 
where her body is located. They find some witnesses at this reservation that described a truck that they had seen driving into the woods. So this would be near the body recovery site. Right. On the same day that Kathy Sue Miller vanished. They described this vehicle as a Chevrolet camper truck yellow with black stripes and a silver canopy. That's a pretty unique description. Yeah, that sounds like a unique, creepy camper. Chevrolet camper truck yellow with black stripes and a silver canopy. I think when you go to buy the the truck camper bed combo, that they make sure that you have a criminal history or you're not allowed to buy one. The thing here in this situation is that is a spot on description of Harvey Kerrigan's truck, right? We get three different colors there. We get, we get the make, we get the canopy silver canopy cover. Yep. And all of that lines up on the day that this kid went missing. So police are like, okay, well we have a murder case here. But now we have the ability to check for fingerprints in this vehicle. Because, unfortunately, what you're looking for is you're trying to put your victim in that vehicle. You want to find her fingerprints. What they do is they pull a few prints. They were palm prints off of the window pane, the inside of the window pane. And they know that they're not Harvey Kerrigan's prints. They go back to the mother with this information. Here's the problem. And this happens still to this day, 50 years later, but especially a problem in 1973. And we've talked more than one time here in this garage show about the identikits that you can get from the FBI. You can get them from our friends over at the NICMEC, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. Right. These are identikits to... Update all of your kids' information. This is fingerprints, palm prints, an updated picture, an updated description of height and weight and eye color and hair color and all that stuff with your child's information. This is key here. And look, in this situation, it's not going to save Kathy Sue Miller, unfortunately. But what it could do is put her proof positive in the killer's vehicle and get this monster off of the streets before he does it again. The problem here, though, Captain, is Kathy Sue Miller, 15 years of age, three weeks before her sweet 16 birthday, had never been printed, had never been fingerprinted. Right. They pull unidentified palm prints from the inside, the interior of this vehicle, but they got nobody to match them to, nobody in the system. And they can't even compare them to their victim because she was never printed. And by the time she's found... She's in a state of decomposition that does not allow them to pull prints. And, and they took they took some great efforts to try to, to still fingerprint her after death. And they were unable to put her and place her in the car. The other problem, too, is the people, more than one person, witnessing this very unique, the three different colors on this vehicle, the make. They had it down to every description, every detail that you can think of. Mm-hmm. The problem ends up being none of these witnesses, while they saw the vehicle on that same day, they couldn't describe the driver. They they all said, well, we never saw the driver. We never saw anybody get in or out of the vehicle. Well, we see this a lot with many serial killers, especially back in the day because of less technology. But it seems like these killers that are able to kill for a, a longer span of time, there's a little bit of luck on their side. Unfortunately, it's been my experience that the killer gets lucky and the dead victim just never ends up with much luck. And you have to believe it was never reported, but I would I would be willing to bet here that they probably tried to find her prints in the business or at his home or decided to not go that route once they learned that she had never been printed. You pointed it out, and I second it. I echo that statement of here's these two detectives doing everything that they can even before it's confirmed that she was abducted or missing 
yeah. that she wasn't some runaway. So what's the next step for these detectives? The next step is trying to build a case against this guy, right? You want to build a case against him for Kathy Sue Miller's abduction and murder. But if you can't, they're running into dead end after dead end here. The evidence is always leading them back to Harvey Kerrigan, but not giving them enough proof to make an arrest, not enough proof to charge him with anything and bring him in and, and, and bring him before the courts. I do want to point out something that I, that I failed to mention earlier when we talk about the efforts that these two detectives were making right. against Harvey Kerrigan. Even before Kathy Sue Miller's body was found, they were following him. When, when they had any extra time that they not working other cases, they were surveilling Harvey Kerrigan. One, they were hoping that he might return to the body and that they, that they would find her that way. And that would be their smoking gun. Oh, we've, we followed you to the recovery site. Right. He never did any of that when they were following him around. And so they're trying to build this case against him. Now her body's found. The evidence all leads to him, but it's not proof that it was exactly him that did any of this. Now, we end up having another situation very similar. This is a month and a half later, approximately, where a young woman, Mary Townsend, is attacked. She's waiting at a bus stop. He approached and attacked her from behind, knocking her unconscious. She woke up, and when she does, she is in a vehicle with a man. This man begins commanding sexual favors, and she manages to leap from the vehicle. Now, this is very unfortunate. She was running away from home. Right. And even though she's attacked and... Everything this guy's saying sounds like it's going to lead to a sexual assault. She thankfully is able to escape. She doesn't report this crime at the time. Part of it was because she was running away from home. And so this goes unreported. And then during this time, this is where police are going to try to get their break. They interview Harvey Kerrigan's family. Remember, he's married to a woman that has two children. And during the course of all of this, we got a whole lot of stuff that's going on inside of the four walls of that home. One, the little boy, 11 or 12 years old at this point, Billy, he decides to go and live with his father. Why? Because he says that Harvey, his stepfather, is physically abusing him, beating him up. Right. The daughter still lives there. She is roughly the age of our victim, Kathy Sue Miller. She has told, I, 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 this part of the story is a little difficult for me. I don't know if she's reporting this well after the fact, or if this was known at the time, but at some point she would tell others that she didn't like the way that her stepfather looked at her. She f always felt uncomfortable around him, but never really reports that, she, that he did anything to her. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, what we do know is happening is he is regularly getting upset with his wife and being physical and abusing her. So his wife, Alice, she's in the process of trying to leave Harvey. She files assault charges against him. So the detectives are at least able to pick him up on these assault charges. Now, unfortunately, they're not going to be able to hold him for very long, but they take him off the streets and they were hoping that this would be the crux of the future case that they could build against him. Maybe Alice, his, his wife or soon to be ex-wife knows something about this, or she can provide evidence to them. But that's not going to go the way the detectives want it to go. No, because at some point, Harvey's going to convince her that they should be together and that she should drop the charges. Now, what ultimately ends up happening is that she doesn't decide to go back with him. So he, Harvey Kerrigan, again, this is incredibly shocking to me. He ends up finding another woman 
to date. She's 29 years old. 29 years old, Elaine Hunley. And they strike up this relationship and they move out to Minnesota. Remember, he he had been in Minnesota prior to going to Seattle, Washington. Right. The detectives tell him, look, you shouldn't be leaving the state. We're investigating you for several different crimes, one including murder. And he says, you don't have a choice. I have to work. He decides to sell the gas station. He moves to Minnesota. And it's obvious to detectives that he's trying to duck these charges, go to a place where they have no jurisdiction, and they've not been able to build a case against him yet. And once in Minnesota, they are living together. Him and Elaine Huntley are living together. At some point, she decides to break off this relationship. I don't know why exactly she decides to break off the relationship, but we do know that he was physically abusive to his two prior wives. Oh, and he's fugly. <laughs> right, right. You better have a nice personality when you look like Harvey it's Kerrigan. It's hard to, he's hard to look at. She breaks off the relationship and then presto change poof, disappears. I mean, he is so fugly that it kind of hurts your eyes. It's like stings a little bit. I'm unsure how they narrowed down this date. I'm sure that Elaine Hunley probably told some of her friends or family what was going on in their relationship. But the report is that she left Harvey Kerrigan on August 9th, 1974. This is after they're already settled down living in Minnesota. She leaves him August 9th of 1974. It's reported that she's missing, had disappeared the next day. Unfortunately, Elaine Hunley, her body would be found a little under five weeks later. And she had been murdered. Her skull, she was beat so badly that her skull had imploded by blows to the head. And she had been raped with an object, a tree branch. And that was rather obvious during the autopsy. Of course, that is going to now put Harvey Kerrigan under the microscope in the state of Minnesota. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Sometimes we're faced with a crossroads in life, and we don't know which path to take. Maybe you're thinking about a career change or feeling like your relationship needs some TLC. Whatever it is, therapy can help you map out your future and trust yourself to find the way forward. Throughout times in my life, I've felt that therapy is right for me. And while I was a little apprehensive at first, each and every time I have found therapy to be an enlightening and positive experience. If you are thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist anytime for no additional charge. Let therapy be your map with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. If you've been wanting to learn a new language because you have an upcoming international trip, Rosetta Stone, the most trusted language learning program is for you. Rosetta Stone is available on desktop and can also be used as an app on your phone or tablet. Rosetta Stone teaches through immersion. Learn by matching audio from native speakers to visuals, reading stories, participating in dialogues, and more practical language skills. Choose from 25 languages, including Spanish, French, Dutch, and Arabic. It's used by millions and has been around for 30 years because it works. With Rosetta Stone's true accent feature on how well you are pronunciating words. Plus, find lessons as short as 10 minutes that can be done anytime. 
That's why I love Rosetta Stone. I can study anywhere at any time. Whether you're learning Rosetta Stone at home on your desktop or on the go on the Rosetta Stone app, you can learn from 25 different languages anytime, anywhere. Don't put off learning that language. There's no better time than right now to get started. For a very limited time, True Crime Garage listeners get Rosetta Stone's lifetime membership for 40% off. That's $179 for unlimited access to for 25 language courses for the rest of your life. Redeem your 40% off at rosettastone.com slash garage today. rosettastone.com slash garage. If you're a parent, you want to be doing everything you can to set your child up for success in life. So make sure to check out IXL. IXL is an online learning program for kids. Use it on your computer, phone, or tablet. IXL covers math, language arts, science, and social studies through interactive practice problems from pre-K to 12th grade. IXL even has skill plans for specific textbooks. As kids practice, they get positive feedback, awards, and clear explanations when they get questions wrong. Plus, as your kid uses it, the IXL program figures out what your kids need more help with and adapts. You'll save so much time. One subscription gets you everything. All subjects, all grade levels, one site. You'll save so much money, too. Memberships start at only $9.95 a month. IXL is something that all the parents are leaning on these days. The kids take a break for summer. You don't want them forgetting everything that they learned last year and starting off slow this year. No. My friends tell me their kids are loving the IXL experience, and the parents are very happy with IXL as well. It's something you will want to check out. With the school year ramping up, now is the best time to get IXL. Our listeners can get an exclusive 20% off IXL membership when they sign up today at IXL.com slash truecrimegarage. Visit IXL.com slash truecrimegarage to get the most effective learning program out there at the best price kids today have seriously upped their game my guess it's xfinity mobile back in the day if you want to score a fresh new pair of sneakers you'd be stuck at home refreshing reloading now with xfinity mobile my little sis has got the connection to run circles around me online and at the three-point line they grow up so fast i'm a fan from xfinity home of the 10g network Restrictions apply. Xfinity Unlimited intro service and Xfinity internet required. Taxes and fees extra. Reduced speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage. Data thresholds may vary. All right, we are back. Cheers, mates. Tall cans in the air. He's back, and I'm out to lunch. Yeah. <laughs> He's been out to lunch for years. This brings us to September of 1974 on our timeline here, Captain, when a young woman, her name is Gwen Burton, she's picked up from a Sears parking lot. This is because she's having car trouble, and a man who she thought might be helpful, a good Samaritan, decides to stop and offer her assistance. He gets out of his vehicle, takes a look at her vehicle and says, look, I can help you out here, but I don't have the tools needed to take care and fix the problem. If you hop in the vehicle with me, we can go to my house real quick, pick up the tools. I'll fix up your car and send you on your way. Right. So Gwen thinks here we got a situation where maybe someone's come to help me. And she gets in the vehicle and she realizes, look, this ride seems very long. Why would this guy, why would anybody agree to help me if, if we got to go so far away to get to his home just to get these tools? Right. So she starts feeling uncomfortable and, and says to him, look, could you please just return me to my car? You don't have to fix the car. It was nice of you to, to attempt. It was nice of you to try to help me out. But, you know, you make excuses. I'm in a hurry. Or... Uh, any reason to get out of that vehicle at this point because she's now getting very nervous and she doesn't feel like we're going to his house to retrieve tools. Take me back to my vehicle. At some point, she starts telling the man, 
or you could just let me out here and I'll figure it out. I'll, I'll find my way back to my car or to my home. Mm-hmm. It is then that he refuses to let her out of the vehicle and he gets physical with her, ripping off of her, ripping off her clothing and he's choking her in the vehicle. He then takes her to a field where he sexually assaults her with a hammer and then beats her with said hammer and flees the area. Unbeknownst to the man, Gwen Burton survives. Bloodied and close to death, she crawls to help. Well, to have the strength to keep going. Sometimes the will to live is stronger than the will to die. So that was September 14th. Now this will bring us up to September 18th. Four days later, we have two teenage girls who are walking on the side of the road when they are approached by a man in a vehicle, and he offers them, he offers to pay them $25 each. And what he is requesting is that he needs to go retrieve his son's vehicle from a, a location that he may have told to the girls. I'm unclear on that. But he's saying, look, the problem is I'm by myself. I'm flying solo here. I need somebody else to drive either my vehicle or his vehicle once I get to it. I will pay you each $25. It won't take long. His vehicle is only a couple miles down the road. This seems like easy money, a lot of money at the time for the girls. And so they say yes. They get into the vehicle with this man that they do not know. And after they're driving for a while, again, He's, he's now going out into, out into the country, out to the sticks. And they're starting to wonder, like, this seems a lot further than what he had told us. And one of them questions the man and says, look, where are we going? This doesn't make a lot of sense. This is a lot further than you had said. And we, we have things to do. We, you know, our parents are going to be looking for us at some point. And the man says to the two teenage girls, Would you rather be killed or would you rather be raped? And the one girl nudges the other girl and speaks up for both of them and says, we would rather be killed. The other girl agrees and says, we would rather be killed. When the man finally stops the vehicle, he instructs the girls that one of them is to stay with his vehicle and the other is to go with him to retrieve his son's vehicle. Unfortunately for the girl who agrees to go with this man, I believe she agreed to go with the man to spare her friend. This trip, this walking trip away from his vehicle is going to take them into the woods, which of course these are teenage girls. They're not idiots. They're wondering why there's no way this guy's kid's son's vehicle was in the woods. No. But I believe she went with him simply to spare her friend. Yeah, I mean, I think once once he poses the question, rape, would you rather be raped or killed? I think they know that they're not going anywhere. I think at that point, they know everything before that question was a ruse. Exactly. And here's the weird thing, though. What we would learn is it said that he didn't say that in like a, like a threatening manner, even though just those words in themselves are threatening. But it, they said that he almost posed it like a philosophical question. Right. Uh, a hypothetical of some, some sort. Regardless, now she's in the woods with this guy and, and he does physically attack her. He, he hits her with a hammer. And then for unknown reasons there, he decides to let her live and he gets in his vehicle and he drives off, leaving the two girls there. Now, what we end up having here, captain is in the course of these four days, we end up having three different people, three different young ladies that come forward and go to police and they describe the vehicle that they were in. They described the man that they had had talked to. He, we, what we would ultimately learn is he used a fake name on both occasions 
when introducing himself and talking with the, the victims that were in his vehicle. But unfortunately this does not lead to an arrest fast enough because on September 20th, 1974, two days later, 18 year old Catherine Schultz disappeared. Her body was found the very next day in a cornfield. She had been beaten to death with a hammer so badly that her skull had imploded and they knew that she had been sexually assaulted, but not in a traditional rape manner that she had been assaulted with an object. Okay. So we're starting, a lot of these things are starting to align where you have these victims that survive these attacks and they're describing attacks that are very similar to the ones that we end up knowing led to the death of Catherine Schultz and Elaine Hunley. Elaine Hunley was in the relationship living with Harvey Kergnip. All of this will lead to them securing a search warrant for his vehicle in Minnesota. When they search his vehicle underneath the seat, they find maps to several different States and they find like it's all, it's described almost as like a hairball or a clump of hair, but, but the hair's not all belonging to the one person. Right. And so what detectives in Minnesota believe is that this is the hair of several different victims that found its way either under the seat or, or matted into the seat. But these maps are of extreme interest to the detectives because that has many locations that are circled in different states. Now we already covered that Harvey Kerrigan lived in Alaska. He lived in the state of Washington and he's lived in Minnesota. Well, what they find is two of the locations that are circled on those maps. One of them, they know to have been the location where 15 year old Kathy Sue Miller's body was recovered from in the state of Washington. The other thing that they noticed too, is that one of the circles on that map for the state of Washington is where they found the body of a victim that we previously mentioned, but did not go through the story. And that is of Laura Leslie Brock. Remember, she was a woman who went missing just 70 days, approximately 70 days after Kathy Sue Miller went missing. Right. So the story behind this, Captain, is on Thursday, September 14th, 1972, the body of a young woman, 20-year-old Laura Leslie Brock, who was a sophomore at Western Washington State College, was found in Coopville, Washington down a dirt road about one half mile west of Oak Harbor. The body was nude except for a pair of navy blue socks. She had been raped and died from severe hemorrhaging from several very brutal blows to the head with an undetermined object. The body was found on the 14th and then later identified on Tuesday, September 19th, 1972. Authorities found a note at Miss Brock's rooming house that she was leaving for the beach and she spoke with her grandmother prior to leaving. And by all accounts, her intention was to hitchhike. We can confirm this based on the fact that her grandmother told her in that conversation, do not hitchhike and warned her of the dangers of hitching. Right. And Laura explained to her mother, her grandmother that it's legal to do so. And that she was in fact going to hitchhike to the beach. She was going from Bellingham, Washington to the Olympic peninsula. This is one of those cautionary tales that all parents tell children and that friends warn one another about saying things like, remember Laura Brock, her first hitchhiking trip was her last. This case became political at the state level. In fact, this is one of the policies that was in debate for a few years in the state of Washington. We have Jim Costanti running for state senator pointing out that Senator Senator Peterson voted for what Costanti's team was calling a legislative tragedy. Bad judgment for government is what he called it. So, Well, just because something's legal, like she's telling her grandma, doesn't mean that it's safe. Exactly. And here's that's the exact problem. So oddly enough, legislation made hitchhiking legal in the state of Washington that year, the very year that she goes missing. 
and she's later found dead. With this horrific event, the goal then became twofold for the state. One, any crime involving a hitchhiker to be sent to the state police. And two, make hitchhiking illegal again in the state. But to your point, Captain, listen to this statistic. Washington State Police and the Seattle Washington Police Department reported that over the course of about 15 months, that once hitchhiking became legal in mid-1972, The stats are that the state of Washington averaged about 20 hitchhiking-related crimes per month, two of which resulted in murder. That's too many. One is the Laura Brock case that we talked about in September of 72, and the other is Catherine Mary Devine's murder in November. Other crimes related to hitchhiking range from robbery to rape. So, not good, Bob. Now, note that Harvey was never charged with Laura Brock's murder. And in fact, no one else has ever been charged in her murder either. But Harvey Kerrigan, all these years later, 51 years later, remains the prime suspect in Laura Brock's murder based on the fact that he received a speeding ticket in the area where her body was found right around the time that she went missing. On top of that, We also have a witness who claimed that they saw Laura get into a vehicle that when they provided the description to police matched Harvey Kerrigan's truck. Well, like we said, sometimes these killers get unlucky, but this killer is also just dumb. I mean, he has a very unique paint job and color scheme of the vehicle he's using to abduct these women. Yes, in this situation, you know, he's he's getting lucky time and time again because they have a lot of signs, they being the authorities, law enforcement, detectives, they have a lot of signs pointing directly to Harvey Kerrigan in a lot of this, but they don't have any direct evidence until they find these maps. Now, what they're going to do is they're going to build a circumstantial case, a mountain of circumstantial evidence against Harvey Kerrigan in the Minnesota cases. The two cases that we circled back to, Kathy Sue Miller and Laura Brock's cases, they took place in Washington just a couple years prior to what would ultimately be Harvey Kerrigan being arrested and interviewed, interrogated by the Minnesota police. What ultimately happens here, Captain, is he gets an attorney and Harvey Kerrigan then tells police yeah, the Minnesota crimes that you're charging me with, because he, the problem he's facing here is those three living witnesses. Right. He might get lucky in the murders that he caused because, unfortunately, he silenced those victims, and they're not there to put him away, but the three living witnesses are. And he ultimately tells the detectives, I did what you say that I did. His defense, insanity. He says God told him to kill those women. Now, the good thing here is that this horrible, evil man will 100% be off of the streets. It's where do we send him to? Right. An institute or a prison. This thing goes to trial, and they were very smart here on, on a few different levels. So they they charge him with attempted murder and aggravated sodomy, and he's going to have to go to trial for those charges first before he will face any of the murder charges in court. And he puts together this defense of God told me to kill the whores, and these women that I assaulted were whores. And I'll tell you what, this guy, this is what strikes me about Harvey Kerrigan. He comes off as this kind of oaf, like this dumb oaf. Like, it, and part of that is his appearance, and part of that is his delivery and the way uh, his speech, the way that he talks. But unfortunately, he's not an unintelligent man. He He is intelligent enough that while on the surface, this God told me to do it defense sounds absolutely crazy and sounds so backwards, but Harvey takes to the stand. 
He's going to testify at court, and he does a pretty good job. I've reviewed the transcripts. And in fact, if you read the One Ad Killer book by the great Ann Rule, she goes through large portions of that trial. He takes to the stand and he goes one-on-one with the prosecutor, toe-to-toe. And one thing that is so bizarre, but again, he knows he's being locked up. It's just where are you going to send him to? But he's going to play the part. He should Maybe you give him the Oscar. I don't know. But when he's on the stand, they point to uh, one of the women that's there at court who he almost killed. They point to they point to Gwen Burton, the poor woman that he picked up from the Sears parking lot, offered to help that he nearly beat to death. In fact, we know, Captain, that when he left her there in that field, he believed she was already dead. Mm-hmm. She crawls to safety and later is facing him in court. And you know what he says? He says, you know what? Yeah, not only did God tell me to kill her, but given the chance, again, I would finish the job. He says that on the stand at trial in front of the jury. This is meant to be a a tactic to convince the jury that God is actually telling him to kill the whores. What What they trip him up on is all of the sexual assault that she had to experience before he attempted to kill her. Mm -hmm. He gets convicted of the attempted murder and aggravated sodomy charges. And then we're going to follow that up with early the next year, 1975, when Harvey Kerrigan is then found guilty on both. uh, Sorry. Then we're going to follow up that. Then we are going to follow that up with the following year in 1975, when he is, charged with second degree murder and first degree murder, and then found guilty on those charges based off of a mountain of evidence and this defense of God told me to do it. One tactic that I thought was really interesting here, Captain, and this is very mine hunter ish. This is something that the first generation of mine hunters would, would tell you to do. Harvey Kerrigan did not like the two detectives that stayed on his tail so much back in Seattle, Washington. Homan and Bowman. Dwayne Homan and William Bowman. He did not like them. The Minnesota authorities, the prosecutor, reached out to the two detectives and said, please, reach out to the Seattle Police Department. Please, would you send one or both of the detectives to sit at the trial just to unnerve Harvey Kerrigan, just so he has to see one or both of the detectives that he despised so much for following and tailing him all that time and basically running him out of Seattle, Washington. He fled that area. He makes it look like it was because of a relationship and a job opportunity, but he had a successful business in Seattle, Washington. Sure enough, they put one of the detectives in the courtroom at trial, but again, the size of this man And the fear that this man instilled into others, and we've talked about this before, Captain, it's rare that members of law enforcement, especially seasoned detectives, are afraid of a certain criminal. One of the detectives did go to the trial, but he told told the prosecutor and the police out in Minnesota, he goes, I will go because it will help you at trial, and I want to see this guy put away especially because we weren't able to put him away here for murders we know he committed. But you have to promise me that I get an aisle seat because I've seen Harvey Kerrigan mad and angry and upset. And if he gets that way when he sees me, I don't want anything standing between me and the door. Well, Harvey the Hammer's luck would finally run out. At the age of 95 years old, he would die in prison. 
Yes, unfortunately, Harvey Kerrigan was never sentenced to death again after getting off of that charge for killing Showalter way back in 1949. And so he is convicted, sentenced to life in prison at the age of 49. So think about that for a minute. 30-year time span, roughly, that this man was out and killing. And we believe five murdered victims, probably more, and I say that just based off of the randomness of his crimes and the time period that he committed these crimes. He's, at at the simplest form, he's picking up a stranger on the side of the road and then assaulting and killing them and then just leaving them out in the open. He's he's your typical disorganized killer, serial killer, charged and convicted of three murders, definitely did five in my humble garage opinion, probably more. He died in March of 2013, so 50 years after he killed 15-year-old Kathy Sue Miller. He was diagnosed with He was diagnosed with prostate cancer in 1997 and lived all of these years in Oak Park Heights Prison in Minnesota until passing away this year. I want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage this week. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? Yes, we do, Captain. This week, I'm very excited to recommend to all of the listeners the Want Ad Killer by one of the greatest and one of the legends of true crime storytelling, the great Anne Rule. This is just one of her many shattering and thought-provoking true crime stories. Make sure you check out The One Ad Killer and all of the other great titles in Anne Rule's catalog, and check out all of our recommendations by going to our recommended page on the website truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't live. Kids today have seriously upped their game. My guess is Xfinity Mobile. Back in the day, if you want to score a fresh new pair of sneakers, you'd be stuck at home refreshing, reloading. Now with Xfinity Mobile, my little sis has got the connection to run circles around me online and at the three-point line. They grow up so fast. I'm a fan. From Xfinity, home of the 10G network. Restrictions apply. Xfinity Unlimited intro service and Xfinity internet required. Taxes and fees extra. Reduced speeds after 20 gigabytes of usage. Data thresholds may vary.